Welcome back to another episode of NBA Mike. In today's episode, I want to introduce Dinesh Mutvel. Dinesh was born Indian, but he was raised in the Middle East and he has an extremely strong interest in the gaming industry and quite a lot of knowledge in the sector too. So on today's episode, we're going to talk about his experiences that have brought him to the NBA, but what he wants to do in the future as well, and how he thinks the gaming industry is going to contribute towards the innovation of the future. Uh, Dinesh, do you want to give an introduction yourself about your journey before before the MBA? Sure. So uh, I did my bachelor's in engineering in India uh, in one of the top private colleges in uh, Chennai. And after which I worked with data consultancy services for a couple of years as a developer. Uh, the main idea behind that was that uh, because I wanted to get into the gaming industry even then, uh, but because the number of opportunities were fewer, I thought I'd build my skills in the area that you know most mattered, which is programming. And so I picked up a lot of skills around C, C++, Java, even before college. Uh, strengthened it a bit further during college as well, even though I was pursuing a degree in electronics engineering. And after I completed my engineering, I thought I'd gain some relevant industry experience by working for a company like TCS. Uh, given that I already had so much knowledge in terms of programming, uh, TCS realized that you know I had a very good aptitude for programming and put me into a development project. Uh, I worked there for a couple of years and realized that it was not as challenging as I expected it would be and I wanted to have a greater impact in terms of you know uh, creating solutions and making sure that they are implemented on the field and so I thought I'd pursue a, de uh, a degree in management and move into the managerial track which is what I did with IAM when the opportunity came up in 2014. Uh, after my MBA, I decided to return into IT business development, where I was a part of uh, uh, the sales and uh, strategy team for uh, the healthcare practice of one of the large companies there. And after a couple of years, I realized sales was more around selling rather than you know coming up with real ideas and you know products in the field. So I thought I'd move into more of a strategic track. And when that opportunity came up with Cognizant, I took it. I was a part of the healthcare sales strategy team. Then from there, I moved on to corporate strategy for a couple of years. And over this period, I realized and, you know, I explored a lot of different roles across the IT services industry, including product roles. I worked with the finance teams, worked with marketing teams, worked with the delivery teams who actually implement the software on the ground. And I realized that the scope of IT services was not where I could kind of visualize having the kind of impact I wanted in terms of creating products that change the lives of people. And so I thought I'd do another MBA to shift into that particular track in terms of moving into either core tech or in gaming where uh, product experiences form the heart of the entire industry. And so that's what's brought me here. And over here, I've had a lot of different experiences which have put me in track to you know, achieve that goal. And I hope to see that yeah. come to fruition over the next few months. Yeah, um, and not, not to bucket yourself, yeah. uh, but you know, as, as, as humans, we love uh, categorizing. Would mm. you classify yourself as a, an engineer by background or uh, you know, a, a tech consultant? How, how would you describe you, yourself professionally, if you could? If I could, I would be a jack of all trades because I really love learning a lot of different things. So even when it came to engineering, I actually went out of my scope to actually learn programming and many other things as well. So it's, uh, it's very difficult for me to identify as just an engineer who can say, I've specialized in this area and it's something that I really want to do. Uh, probably because I hold a very high bar for myself as well. Yeah. Because many people would still feel that in terms of skill I meet, you know, uh, the requirements for any of these jobs, be it engineering, management, or anything else. Yeah. But the way I see it, you're only an expert at it if you can single-handedly create something of value from, you know, uh, any particular project or uh, of that sort. Yeah. So that way I'm not an expert, but when it comes to other areas, in engineering I'm pretty smart, uh, pretty uh, capable mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, understanding engineering concepts uh, within, say, a few weeks and then implementing it. So I think my practical approach towards things is exactly what you know made me reach where I am today, and that's how I would explain. Yeah, uh, but uh, professional culture-wise, would you describe yourself as an engineer? So, for example, okay. uh, my background being from from science, uh, I tend to overthink things. I I tend to make things theoretical, even when they probably shouldn't be. Okay. Uh, so that I would say that's my mindset of of a scientist. Would, right. you, would you describe your <laughs> umbrella mindset as as being that of an engineer who wants to solve problems and uh, find solutions for things? Basically, right, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So my 
core mindset is that of an engineer who likes to look at problems from a very theoretical lens and try to break it down see if these solutions fit in and you know try to implement it and over time i inculcated the skills of a consultant in terms of you know how you approach clients how do you understand their problems how do you actually uh, see what can work for them because it's not just about the solution working it's also about them accepting the solution so mm-hmm. figuring out those nuances and trying to make it work from both sides so that's something i picked up along the way yeah um and i noticed uh it said abu dhabi on your linkedin yeah. what what was that about you you did your school in abu dhabi or was it something yeah else? so i've i've lived a major part of my childhood in the middle east uh, uh-huh. so my father was a uh, uh, oil and drilling uh, expert uh, by profession and so he started his career in ongc when i was uh, in my under uh, in my primary school and within a few years he got a promotion uh, another job in kuwait in uh, kuwait national oil company i think so kntc so we moved there after a year when he uh, completed his probationary period and since then i've been in the middle east mostly yeah. throughout so i lived for 5 years in kuwait another two and a half in qatar and another five in uh, abu dhabi so yeah and, and yeah. what age were you when you made that move to the middle east uh, i was probably 7 when i moved there yeah okay. and then oh, i wow. stayed there for uh, i see a lot of overlaps with myself so i moved to to india when i was 7 years old from the uk <laughs> okay. uh, but okay. I, how did you find it culturally uh, you know moving to to a place where i i guess at the time uh, no i'm not saying you're <laughs> old but you know at the time it was a different time yeah. uh, the the market was completely different uh, yeah. the middle east didn't have the development that it Uh, does now yeah. well, well, probably did have the development but you couldn't see it visually right, uh, right. so what what was it like culturally moving there so culturally uh, so when i moved to kuwait we were part of a small community where a lot of other indians also used to say stay so it wasn't too different culturally but in terms of the school the education of course you had people coming in from many different uh, backgrounds um you had people from all over india actually coming in and st- uh, studying in uh, cbse schools there with uh, which i was in as well and uh, apart from school and home uh, when you actually look at the extended uh, ecosystem there in terms of the shops that are there and uh, the standard of living etc was definitely more than how I, how i would expect it to be in india at that point so that kind of changed dramatically and in terms of you know getting along with the locals and everything that was a different equation but uh, i did make a few local friends but although it was very difficult yeah but uh, yeah you generally get along and you realize that you know this is what works for you and i made the best of you know all those things there in terms of you know um, building lifelong friendships of course even without facebook uh, we still uh, stayed in touch so that kind of helped that time yeah. and uh, yeah uh, so culturally i feel it also changed me in terms of you know my a uh, view on religion which would have been very different if i'd stayed in india mm-hmm. so in terms of being at the heart of you know uh, a place where islamic culture is the norm and where you hear prayers happening every day yeah. at different times of day you know uh, so i got more into you know uh, understanding what is the spiritual sense of religion and mm-hmm. you know uh, developing my sense of religion that way yeah so i right now i identify myself as an agnostic or Uh, of sorts but yeah. at the same time very spiritually inclined yeah so i owe a lot of that to my cultural influence in the middle east yeah w- would you say it's sort of uh, imparted this uh, culture of discovery in yourself so yeah. you you prefer learning about things rather than taking it yeah. at face value yeah absolutely yeah uh, and and obviously i'm extremely biased because i've had uh, you know similar turmoil in in my childhood and moving <laughs> around uh nationally uh, but would you say there are definite advantages uh from having that you know not not a lot of uh children uh you know shift uh, regions completely during their schooling yeah absolutely so uh i feel that kind of makes you more of a risk taker in general because you are always moving you don't really have a stability to actually fall back on and you know get comfortable uh you're always looking for something to make you uncomfortable and learn more and i feel that's a very important thing to have if you really want to you know expand your horizons and uh, you know achieve more because what i've observed is people who have grown in the same place uh, in a very uh, in the same place in the same way educated in the same area they're more likely to actually want to stay uh, there and you know build their career there itself as much as possible even if there are other opportunities outside so trying to convince them that you, it is you know a good thing to actually take this risk 
uh, they actually see it as more of a risk than it actually is because they don't want to move away from that sense of uh, stability in a way. So I feel for me, uh, I mean, uh, me versus my wife who has actually grown up in the same, uh, same place all her life. Uh, I'm more open to actually taking such risks in terms of moving to a different place. The same place in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. so okay. it's the same as well. So yeah. I think that's a big uh, difference for, between the both of us. Maybe I'm, I'm just, you know, kind of extrapolating here. Yeah, I'll have to ask your wife for a, for a, a more clearer <laughs> response about how she feels about yourself and your experience. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, gaming. Uh, I, I've had probably some of the most interesting conversations around the gaming industry with yourself. And as far as I know, you're one of the few or the only person in the MBA program who I've spoken to about uh, having such a strong interest in the gaming industry mm -hmm. and also seeing such a, a strong potential in the industry uh, for the impact that it might have in the future. Right. Uh, where does gaming come in uh, from this story that you just mentioned? It sounds like you've had no exposure to the gaming industry so far, but something has you know, sparked your interest in that industry. What, what is that? So if I have to talk about gaming in my life, I'll have to go back to when I was eight, when my dad actually came back from Kuwait. Uh, he bought his first uh, knockoff of the Nintendo Entertainment System, which was very popular that time because uh, the whole market was flooded with all kinds of fakes of that sort. So he brought that system along, along with a few cartridges which had like 20, 100 games or so. And I, I can already remember... tell when you were born based on that. <laughs> <laughs> so... The first game I played on that cartridge was Mario and you know how it is. Uh, once you get a taste of Mario, you really don't re let go of the gaming industry and that too at that age. Uh, I quickly saw myself spending a lot of time trying to master that platformer more than anything else and uh, from there it was more around you know exploring and trying to master these things and I guess back then the feeling was it is another equal avenue of skill where skill really matters and it's something that really appeals to kids at that age in terms of, you know, what they want to achieve and the sense of achievement you get from, you know, finishing a game is something that really draws kids to it. It's more around that experience. And after that, when I had reached uh, Kuwait, uh, when I was in third or fourth grade, I was kind of getting close to my teenage years and, you know, you need more substance than just gameplay at this point. And that's when I think the PlayStation actually came out. And, uh, PlayStation 1? Uh, yeah, PlayStation 1. In your, in your university? Uh, uh, in, uh, in Kuwait, when I was in fourth grade. Oh, fourth grade, yeah. okay. Yeah. So around that time, it was my dream to actually get a PlayStation because the games then were really interesting. You had games like Crash Bandicoot, you had Spyro the Magic Dragon, and all the PlayStation classics so go, shown on you know, demos and shops, etc. So I made a deal with my dad that, you know, if I get really high, high marks in this particular exam, you'll have to buy me a PlayStation. And uh, my dad was a little skeptical because I never really gave too much importance to academics before then. <laughs> so he kind of underestimated me on that, but I got exactly the right scores that he had set. So I, I, I think with I scored... With the correct motivation yeah, drivers. Yeah. So there were five sub... You know, we had seven subjects of which he told me that maths and science I had to score perfect marks. And in the remaining four, I had to score more than 90%. And I did. <laughs> and he was very surprised by it. So after that, he brought my, uh, bought me the PlayStation. I remember the guy in the shop actually telling my father, uh, you would be better off not buying this for your son. <laughs> he's, Why? He's not going to study ever again if he buys this. <laughs> and uh, my dad yeah, still and, and tells me the same PS1, thing. PS1, so like, uh, yeah. you know, gaming industry is fairly, uh, it's not new, but it's, it, it's the second wave of the gaming industry, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And in most households, this is the fear that they still have. I mean, even if you come to India, you see a lot of parents worried about their kids actually studying. I mean, even in one of the interviews I've had with the IAM earlier, I've been, you know, very vocal about the gaming industry being the future and the interviewers only come up with a, a rebuttal saying, my kids are not studying because of gaming. What do you say to that? I mean, it's a fair point, yeah. but then there are many other positives <laughs> to the gaming industry, which yeah. people don't really see, which is what I really feel yeah. is the future of the industry. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, creating a rebuttal against food for saying my kid eats too much McDonald's and yeah. is now obese. Yeah. Therefore, we need to eradicate food. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, li a little bit narrow to, <laughs> yeah. to think that way. Yeah. Yeah. So once I got my PS1 again, 
uh, played a lot of games, academics went uh, down to the south. PS2 came somewhere around the 8th or 9th grade and then again I had another another bet with my dad and again I <laughs> beat that and got the PS2 as well. And uh, that so was around the time. So this is incentivizing you on yeah, your journey to yeah. better education yeah. as well. Yeah. And around the time when PS2 came, I realized that there was a dramatic shift in terms of the narrative for games, in terms of the story-driven element. You had games around very popular franchises like Harry Potter, which had open-world elements. You could go all yeah, around right. Hogwarts and you can even get on your broom and fly around the <laughs> entire castle and everything. I mean, that's so every yeah, Harry Potter so. fan's dream, right? I mean, <laughs> back then. So I was really hooked into it and, you know, gone into more games of that nature. Uh, it was an ever-expanding world for me and, you know, nothing really stopped you from, you know, wanting to explore more. And I think that was yeah. that element of games that really made it more appealing for me. Yeah. Uh, because... Uh, I guess in the real world, you have a lot of other biases that actually come into play when it comes to, you know, interacting with people or doing things or yeah. trying to trying to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. But in games, it's very straightforward. Yeah. It's like you go to a shop, you want to buy something. It's one price. You just buy it if you have the money or not. <laughs> yeah. But and in the real world, it's taking as well. Yeah, yeah. But in the real world, there are so many other biases that come into play. If you look rich, they'll ask you a higher price and then you have to haggle. <laughs> If you're poor, then they don't really give you the uh, opportunity to even buy this thing that you want because they yeah. think that you're not worth it. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of biases, right? We don't really talk about those things in games. And that was, I guess, the kind of comfort zone I got yeah. into. As an equalizer. Yeah, it's kind of like an equalizer. Yeah. And I think that is one of the central tenets of gaming uh, in terms of, you know, it being fair for everyone who plays it. And programmable. Like, yeah, uh, programmable. Uh, and yeah. yeah, at the same time, it's also a bit... Uh, limiting in that it actually puts you into that mindset that everything is kind of you know linear yeah, yeah linear <laughs> and that kind of makes it difficult in the outside world so that's Absolutely. why you need a balance between both. yeah yeah but 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 it sort of in in cold case like uh in it does sort of work in parallel with this engineering mindset of things can be solved uh, there's always a solution yeah or there's always a cheat yeah. code yeah uh, to something if you want yeah. to get something done yeah that's right so it was that kind of mindset that i got into and after that, I continued with my journey along that way. M got a lot into gaming, I would say. Uh, more than I would be socializing, etc. Uh, but then over time... Same for me, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so over time, you kind of, you know, tend to be on your own. You tend to figure things out that uh, you want to do. And that's how I kind of, you know, shape, shape my, the rest of my education and my career as well. So I wanted to really get into the gaming industry or, you know, in tech in general. So I picked up coding skills on my own because I spent a lot of time on my own. I was able to, you know, spend time on this, uh, which would not have been the case if I was in a very comfortable setting where I had yeah. lots of friends and, you know, lots of time to actually yeah. waste on those kinds of activities. Mm. So that kind of, you know, dictated most of my life after that till college. And uh, it was in college that I decided uh, it's time to expand. You know, you, you really need to, you know, uh, pick up uh, real world skills to actually survive in the world. And that's when I really started... Uh, organizing clubs, you know, uh, kinds of events, uh, getting involved in large events. So I set um, the first uh, entrepreneurship cell in my college as well. So I was one of the founding members there. And we organized our very first TED Talk for our college as well there. So that was one. Then uh, we incorporated the uh, first math club in our college. And we also incorporated our mathemat mathematics symposium where I came up with some of the more popular games there. We had one around something around uh, the digital route, which is around, you know, uh, adding numbers together until you get only one number. So that uh, the one who has the highest digital route in these situations would win. And we'd give them a random number of uh, numbers to actually work with, yeah. designed in such a way that there's always one particular combination in which you can always get the highest number. Mm. So we organized those kinds of games and many other things. And I was also a part of uh, organizing the largest gaming fest in my college, which had close to a thousand visitors out of the 1,200 who came for the symposium that time. In fact, it was so popular that we had to go through the entire proceedings even after the symposium was over and actually give them their prizes after that. <laughs> so it was uh, one of the best uh, events that we had in college and it became a tradition after that. Uh, a lot of these were centered around us going against the system and saying we want this. Yeah. Because uh, gaming, I mean, imagine me going to yeah. my head of department and saying, 
gaming is the next big wave. We yeah. need to have this and, if and, we want and, to make and it. And at the time, this is the same world as you know GTA, and uh, yeah. which is coming in papers as you know being yeah. the, the yeah, exactly. a, a violent contributor to how exactly. children behave these days. Yeah, exactly. So it was really great to see that you know there was at least a bit of a dent that we made into uh, this particular picture that uh, we can have gaming as a viable event in our symposiums and you know uh, that kind of developed from there and after getting into my first job I did very well technically um, but then I wanted to move into business development and that's where I thought okay uh, doing an MBA there would help going to IM was an eye-opening experience in terms of you know uh, what I thought was possible in terms of uh, uh, not just uh, managerially but also in terms of uh, other capabilities. I started learning a lot of different things there uh, because of the kinds of people I met there. And they were all at the top of their game in terms of you know one area or the other. There were yeah. musicians who came from uh, some well-known Indian musical bodies. There were uh, consultants coming in from you know BCG McKinsey Bain, uh, people who had worked in Goldman Sachs as analysts and uh, and people from many other various backgrounds as well. Some coming from uh, uh, private equity, some from energy and uh, uh, you know sustainability. Even for that time, so uh, it was very good. You know, yeah, getting that uh, download from each individual person as to how they actually see their careers, why they want to do what they want to do. Until then, I think my driving force behind my career was mainly just the industry alone, rather than what I wanted to do, and uh, or how high I wanted to reach. And probably after the MBA, I really knew that I wanted to reach higher rather than just where I wanted to be. And so when I got back into IT services, I realized that I needed to work better to actually uh, rise up the ranks in terms of, you know, not just capabilities, but also responsibility. And I was able to do that. Uh, so uh, in my last role, I was the manager of corporate strategy, leading a team of around three or four consultants who were uh, working with me on all the deliverables that we made to the senior leadership. So. It was very intense, but at the same time, very fulfilling. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, kind of like that. Yeah. And uh, fast forwarding to 2021, 2022, uh, you've uh, obviously set up a special interest group in yeah. Uh, gaming, yeah. right? So a uh, special interest group is uh, an opportunity that Cambridge Judge Business School gives us to create a group of students that have a an interest in a certain area. You you chose that way uh, to create a group of people that are interested in the gaming industry. Right, right. Uh, what, how, um, what sort of traction have you got from that SIG okay. and uh, what activities have you been doing using that? So you have people coming from, you know, such, uh, you know, intense backgrounds as well who are actually into gaming. And that was very surprising for me. And so talking to more people, I realized that there is a growing interest in the gaming industry as well. Uh, but in terms of those who are very passionate about saying that, you know, this is what I want to do, this is where I really want to be, there are very few who actually have that. And right now in my batch, I'd say it's only me who's very keen on, you know, definitely getting a job in the gaming industry. So that's the place where I feel the SIG is a bit limited. Uh, I felt that if there was a lot more traction in terms of, you know, interest in gaming careers, I could actually host careers around, you know, uh, host events around uh, what kind of careers are there in the gaming industry for, you know, MBAs and how we can actually transition into it. And uh, I've done a fair bit of research into this as well. So I looked into uh, people from Cambridge who have actually gotten into such careers in the past. and. There have only been around one or two people who actually actively look for internships in this space and then land full-time offers in companies like, say, Jagex, which are right. based out of Cambridge, or uh, in other startups in yeah. London and, uh, you know, abro abroad. Mm -hmm. So that's generally the trend uh, that I've seen. And I, I think it's fairly true of our batch as well. It's just that there's a growing interest which is coming through, yeah. uh, which can be, you know, harnessed to actually build on. So that's what I've been doing. So I've been inculcating that passion further yeah. by holding events around yeah. uh, the new types of games that have come out, how we can actually, uh, you know, leverage that. Yeah. Uh, so there was one session we had just a few, uh, just a couple of weeks back, which involved VR. So we were able to get one of the VR headsets, which one of our batchmates had obtained and, uh, you know, have everyone take it for a test drive to see how VR has evolved uh, over the last few years. Mm -hmm. So I myself have a HTC VWay, which I bought back in 2015, 16. And uh, compared to that, the new Oculus Quest 2 that came out recently is like leagues ahead in terms of right, user experience. Okay. So everyone was blown away that uh, yeah. 
all of this is possible with just a single headset. Yeah. So that's where the industry is headed right now, and oh, okay. uh, you know, people are very uh, interested in learning more about these things. Yeah. So oh, that's that's exactly what I'm trying to do with the SIG. So it's around inculcating knowledge around the gaming industry segments, yeah. what kind of offerings they have, and how this is actually shaping user experience uh, going into the future. Yeah. So. Uh, on recent reflection, I realized out of all of the industries uh, that you know MBAs tend to get involved in. Um, I fe felt personally like entertainment is the one that I cannot see a world without. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine how depressing a world would be <laughs> without, you know, virtual or technological entertainment, right. uh, tech-based entertainment like right. VR or, or in the future, potentially the metaverse, but for now gaming and, yeah. uh, you know, d digital gaming and, and competitions online. Right. Uh, this is something I think kids spend most of the time on yeah. uh, as a, you know, non-negotiable for mm -hmm. parents yeah. uh, currently. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I can never see that dying as an industry so uh, quite interesting that you know you're one of the very few that are interested in the in the area but uh, hopefully it, it starts gathering a yeah. bit more interest. 